Welcome everyone, I'm Shaw, and today we're gonna to talk about how we can code 10 times faster using AI. But before getting into that, you might be wondering who is this guy? Why should I listen to him? Here's a little background about me. Got into AI about seven years ago when I was getting my physics PhD at the University of Texas at Dallas. I was an applied AI researcher there. After that, I went on to industry and I worked as a data scientist at Toyota Financial Services. A year into that role, I decided to go out on my own and become an entrepreneur which has meant a lot of different things. So I started doing AI consulting, helped over 100 clients. I've also made a lot of educational content on platforms like YouTube and Medium. So maybe you originally heard about me through one of my YouTube videos. I also have a class now that I teach on AI on Maven, and I've had over 135 students there. And I've also been building my own AI products on the side. So I built two out of my goal of building 20 products and off to a modest start. Clearly, AI has transformed the way we build software. And a big reason for this is that AI can now write all of the code for you. And this works really great until it doesn't. For example, let's say you want to create a function that converts HTML text into Markdown. This is pretty straightforward. You can just take a ask like this, give it to a LLM, and it'll spit out a reasonable function. And this is usually no problem. But let's say we want to do something a little more sophisticated like build an entire app that converts HTML to Markdown. So if we take this ask, even though we just changed a few words, we give it to the LLM, and this is gonna be a very different situation. The LLM is gonna generate a lot of code, but now maybe we have no idea how this code is working. Every time we try to make a change or tweak the front end, the entire code base breaks and we're getting errors that we don't really understand, or we end up spending hours debugging and refactoring code, which is actually longer than it would have taken us to just build the entire app from scratch. So even though AI can write all the code for us, it doesn't necessarily mean we're moving any faster. So where does this go wrong? AI is clearly a powerful tool in writing software, but how can we actually use it to move faster? The place where things typically go wrong is that people not only outsource the coding work to large language models, but they also outsource the thinking. For example, let's take that task from the previous slide of building building an entire app that converts HTML to Markdown, this might sound like a reasonable thing to ask for, but if we go a little deeper, we'll realize that there's a lot missing from this ask. For example, what tech stack do you want to use? Do you want to use Python? Do you want to use JavaScript or like a web development tech stack? What features do you want it to have? Do you want it to take HTML as input? Do you want it to take URLs as input? What do you want the design or the user experience to look like? Is this going to be a web interface? Is this going to be an MCP server? Is this going to be a command line interface? Who is the end user? Who are you building this for? What's the use case? Is this for people to give context to LLMs? And on and on and on. This is often the root cause for when coding with AI goes sideways. Basically, it's when the specs are underspecified or the developer doesn't really know what they want and how they want it built. And so if we boil it down, what AI coding is actually about is not necessarily vibe coding and not really paying very much attention to the development process, but really it's this active process of thinking through what it is you're actually trying to build and clearly defining what you want to the large language model. But of course, this isn't actually enough because even if you have an amazing plan, no plan is ever perfect. So even if you have a spec sheet that gets 95% of the app right or 99% of the app right, there's always going to be unexpected errors or things you didn't realize at the outset of building the project. You also need to be able to understand how the code actually works so you can refine your requests and the specs that you're sending to the large language model. What effective AI coding really looks like is closing the gap between what you're thinking and how the LLM is thinking. And so the extreme case here is kind of like plugging yourself into the matrix. And instead of learning Kung Fu, you have a deep understanding of how your code is actually working. Again, AI coding isn't about vibe coding, even though that can be really fun, it's really this active process of being plugged into your software system and this harmony, this synergy between you and the LLM. So what does this look like in practice? To make this a bit more tactical, I'm going to walk through five helpful tips for effective AI coding. So we'll talk about deploying LLMs in your code base, writing clear specs, providing documentation, iterating on plans, not code, and then committing little and 
often. First tip is to deploy LLMs into your code base. This is really like the zeroth tip. So if you're not already doing this, I think this is the easiest way to speed up your development time with large language models. And the reason this is a good idea is because LLMs are only as good as the context you give them. And when it comes to coding tasks, the best context is the code base itself. So if you're not using LLMs in your code base, you might be doing something like this, where you're going to ChatGPT and you're just making asks like, how do I create a download button with fast HTML? If you've been coding for a while, this is how, at least how I did a lot of coding when I was first learning. When I didn't know how to do something, I would just go to Google, search it up, and then go to like Stack Overflow or some similar forum to find like a snippet of code that I'm missing and then integrating it into my code base myself. But now that LLMs can do a lot of this work for us, it's very helpful to have a AI powered IDE like cursor. And here the LLM will have direct access to your entire repository. So you can cut out a lot of the friction in the code generation process and just ask it, add a download folder to this specific route in main.py. So this is just like an easy way to like 2x, 3x or more your coding times. So you're not copy pasting code from one application into another application. The second tactic is to write project level specifications. So basically telling the LLM what you want it to build and how. One way to do this specifically in Claude code is by generating a Claude.md file. This is something that gets generated automatically with Claude, but often it's helpful to take that 15 minutes or take that 30 minutes at the beginning of the project and think through the high level specifications. What tech stack do you want to use? What do you want the file structure to be? What do you want the UI to look like? And not only does this help give the LLM more guidance in what to build, but it also gives you that clarity of thought, a clear understanding of what you're actually trying to build. So this is helpful for not just the LLM, but also for you as a developer. The third tactic is to provide documentation. This is going to help the LLM avoid mistakes when using some new library or obscure libraries. For example, if your training cutoff for the LLM was six months ago, but you want to use the latest version of some UI library, then it's helpful to give it the updated documentation. Otherwise, the LLM wouldn't know it. Or if you're working with some obscure hardware SDK, like you have some sensor that you're trying to get data off of, and it has some documentation on how their SDK works, the LLM is probably not going to know anything about that. So giving the LLM that SDK is very advantageous. So there are actually a few ways we can do this. The simplest and most flexible is to just create these text files, like a LLM.txt file, or even just raw PDFs, and putting it in a folder in your code base so that the coding agent can access it. So whether you're using like Claude code or cursor, or if you want to upload these files to ChatGPT, just so the code that it generates is going to be a bit more helpful. But also there are going to be like application specific versions of this. So if you're using cursor, they have these so-called cursor rules, and they have these files called .mdc files that specifically help cursors coding agents access pieces of documentation. Or if you're using Claude code, you can use a MCP server. There's this one from context seven, which has access to hundreds, if not thousands of updated documentation. So this is really helpful because you don't have to worry about curating the text files or the .mdc files yourself. You can just connect this MCP server to Claude code or whatever coding agent that you want to use. And it's going to know how to fetch the context that it needs automatically. Fourth tactic is iterating on plans, not code, not just in the context of project level specifications. But if you're trying to implement a specific feature or a specific function that's not trivial, that's going to take multiple steps to implement, it's much more efficient to have the LLM generate a plan and then read the plan and iterate on that instead of having it generate a bunch of code, reviewing the code and iterating on that. And that's just because it's a lot faster. If you're reviewing the code itself, the way this works is the code gets generated, you run the application, you have to see if the app is running or not, if there are any errors, if there are not any errors, even if there are not explicit errors, if the app actually looks or does what you want it to do. And then you need to go try to figure out why that's happening and maybe prompt the LLM like, hey, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? And this is just a very time consuming process. This might take you minutes or even more. But if you're talking about just reviewing plans, a lot of times you'll find mistakes or inconsistencies. Like 90% of the plan that Claude comes up with is perfect, but there's just like one 
step or like one part of a step that's a little off. And it's much easier to just give it feedback on that short plan as opposed to going through this whole process of running the code, reviewing the output, and then trying to debug and figure out what's going on. The reviewing plans usually takes on the order of seconds because you just read the plan and give it feedback. But actually running and reviewing code takes significantly longer. This is a callback to like the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of treatment. And that's very much the essence of what's happening here as well. The final tactic is to commit little and often. Not only does this keep changes very focused, but it also keeps you engaged in the development process. Committing your code, this is in the context of GitHub. So you can do these Git commits and basically have a bunch of checkpoints of your code base. So this is great because you're preserving the working version of your app. And if anything breaks, you can easily just go back to a previous checkpoint and start over, which is something that isn't uncommon when building with large language models, especially if you go down a specific development path and you realize what you're doing is way too complicated or the LLM just gets super confused and generates a bunch of unhelpful code. You can easily just go back to a previous commit and start over. But the second benefit is that it forces you to stay in the loop, stay plugged in to what is actually happening because you have to write these commit messages. So this is a bit more subtle, but if you're writing good commits, then you're probably only going to be doing something one at a time. And the act of writing out and explaining something is a great way to solidify your understanding. So it's kind of like this implicit benefit in this process. I do want to share this example repo, putting these tactics into practice. So I made this app in maybe a couple of hours that converts HTML to Markdown. Open up the GitHub here. And then we can just take a quick look at what's going on here. So the first thing is I have this Claude.md file. The way I generated this is I had like a 20 minute conversation with ChatGPT in voice mode and basically had it help me clarify what I actually wanted to build. Did I want to build this app idea or another app idea? Did I want to make it a web interface? Did I want to make it an MCP server? What tech stack made sense? Actually, I can show that, show what that looked like. So I had this very long conversation with ChatGPT where I guess like 20 minutes and then I had it generate this like summary of our conversation. Also had ChatGPT create this little mock-up of what I wanted to build. So I had like this vision of what I actually wanted the final thing to look like. And then I could take this and have Claude generate the Claude.md file using Claude code. That's what this looks like. And then the other thing I'll point out are these LLM.txt files. So I specifically wanted to use fast HTML to build this app, which is a Python library that allows you to make modern web applications. I wanted to use Daisy UI, which is a front end framework. It's a component library built on top of Tailwind CSS. Also, I wanted to use HTMX for the routing and updating the UI because fast HTML is kind of built to use HTMX by default. So I got these TXT files. So these you don't have to generate yourself. Typically, the library will have one. So this one was created by Daisy UI. This was created by fast HTML. Finally, this one, I don't think HTMX had one. So I went to their documentation and just created a markdown ish version of their documentation. This was enough of a foundation to build the app on top of. I can show you what that looks like in cursor. So this is my development stack. Right now, I'll use Claude code in cursor. So that's what this is. Well, I guess this looks a little confusing. So let me clear this out and then I'll type Claude and this pulls up Claude code here and then I can actually run the application and we can see what that looks like. So we have this little interface. So this was all built with fast HTML and basically one shot. Let's go to the HTMX docs. Let's go to like requests and responses. I'll copy this and then I'll paste this and then do extract. And then we have this little UI and it's not like super trivial. We have this copy button. We have this download button to download the .md file. And it's just grabbing the requests and responses section. It's not pulling the entire URL. So it's a somewhat sophisticated application. Let's go on to the Q&A. But before we do that, I'll just call out the AI Builders Bootcamp. This is a six week cohort on AI. We have weekly sessions, pre-recorded modules and a flip classroom setup. We have example projects you can repurpose. You get direct feedback from me on whatever you're trying to build, whether it's a small project or a big application. There's a private community and then guest lectures from past alumni. And really, I made this course for founders, tech consultants, technical PMs, anyone who's trying to build with AI, whether it's a application, a product or just projects. Being part of this lightning lesson, you can get a 20% discount on the program using
using Lightning 20 at checkout. And also you can use Klarna if you want to do installment plans. Okay, so that's basically it. I'll go through.